ditches, then you'd have things that live at a higher elevation would be overcome by the sedimentation. Next, you'd have your amphibians, reptiles and birds, and uh, I'm sorry, birds and mammals float, the reptiles would, would sink. You also have mobility, an ability to escape. If Noah's flood actually happened, as it is a historical event, then you'd have different mobilities to escape. Plus, we don't find uh, polar bears and humans living together that much. We don't, we find things living in different habitats now. Uh, the, uh, in Gray, Tennessee, the new fossil bed that was discovered that had alligators and red pandas together was a shock for everyone because these things are supposed to live in separate places. We expect to find things in separate rock formations if they live in separate places. Well, That's not too far trees, fetched. Sycamore trees or, or any of the trees today that we don't find in the, on these layers. There's certainly no mobility there. I don't see trees running to the top of the mountain. If you're going to mention plants, you're going to go wading into an area that evolutionists have a terrible time. The evolution of, of plants onto the land during the Silurian rocks. The uh, angiosperm evolution, which Darwin called that abominable mystery, and still isn't solved by evolutionary theorists. You really want to go to plants now? I would. Um, Pick so one. I am a hey. Pick one. in a different kind of transposable <laughs> element. So plants don't have retroviruses, but they have these things called uh, transposable elements. Um, and so it actually the uh, history of our crops is very, very cool because the ancestral crop, um, after it went through a complete chromosomal duplication, that's how we got a lot of the cereal crops that we use today. Um, so instead of just having small portions of genes duplicating and diverging, we had an entire chromosomal duplicating and diverging because plants can tolerate a lot more uh, plasticity than humans can. Plants, plants can be octoploid instead of deployed like us. They have eight. <laughs> Oh, yes, 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 yes. I thought you said jumping beans. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, uh, jumping genes. And again, so plants don't have endogenous retroviruses, but they have these transposable elements. And they move around a lot. And every time they move, they leave little footprints behind uh, that we can follow exactly how we follow um, the DLTRs and endogenous retroviruses. I have a question for both of you. Um, this is in regard to time and decay, so it's kind of on the heels of what we've just been talking about. Uh, Dr. John Ross, a Harvard scientist and uh, evolutionist, says that there are no known violations of the second law of thermodynamics. Have either of you in your research ever found anything that would refute that statement? And uh, what can we gain from it? Um, well, I believe that, that this second law closed systems and um, the earth is considered more of an open system so we get energy from the sun um, and that's how plants can grow and so on so we aren't really a closed system that the second law would well, with all, with, with all due respect, there are four things, there are four conditions that are necessary, and you're speaking to the first two mm -hmm. regarding being on a system. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is, is that you also have to have the ability to capture energy, and then you have to be able to have a mechanism in which you can convert it, right? Those are things that would also be part of the second law, and now we're talking about entropy. So, I, think, I think plants do that pretty yeah, well. Yeah, they do. They do, especially. Uh -huh. And then they and die. Then Plants are living things. That, uh, no one disputes that plants uh, uh, take the energy and channel it, capture it very carefully, control it, and then use it to manufacture glucose molecules from water, carbon dioxide. But how the plants get there is the question evolution must answer, not how does it work. Everyone agrees how it works. Right. Um, so it does go against uh, the law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, only temporarily. It's living on borrowed time. So, uh, Isaac Asimov said in an article in the Smithsonian Magazine called Any Game of Energy and Thermodynamics, You Can't Even Break Even, he said that the second law of thermodynamics is the most powerful generalization that mankind has been able to make about the universe. It's, uh, uh, you can say the Earth's an open system. Uh, and certainly energy does come in, but without some means, some mechanism already in place, already in place to capture that energy and channel it and use it, all you have is hot rocks sitting in the sun, and that's all you can get. 
by, by the loft or other mechanics. Yeah. And so, so open system fun, makes no difference to this. For fun about experiment, um, because I study viruses, um, a lot of scientists think that if, when you go back to the very beginning of life on this planet, that maybe it started as an RNA <coughs> organism. And of course, I'm interested because I study RNA viruses, so I really like getting into this stuff. And so some people think that a, a hypothesis for the origin of life on this planet was that uh, organisms pre-organisms, I guess you'd call them, got their energy from thermal vents. So heat from thermal vents uh, transferred that energy to RNA molecules that, um, hypothesis, that could go through PCR sort of reactions of cooling by going away from the thermal vent and annealing temperatures and moving towards the thermal vent. Now these are all thought of experiments that are just for fun, but there, there's lots of places that we can get energy. Well, since you brought up the idea about where we started, sure. um, I think that is a pretty important question that we'd want to answer. Mm -hmm. And since life can't start in oxygen, since oxygen is corrosive, and since it can't start without oxygen because it's necessary to sustain life, and since it can't start in water because water, as we talked about with hydrolysis, what Dr. Jackson talked about, where do we go from there? Um, I think a lot of the current hypotheses, because they are, they are just thought experiments right now that we use based on the chemistry we have and just the fun ideas people think of. That, I think that's part of the fun of like these origin of life hypotheses. Um, but yeah, there's micro environments. Um, I mean, the, the world back then was very different than the world we have now. So to say that, you know, we need oxygen, we can't have oxygen, it, it might be very different when we're talking about an RNA world where there's just <coughs> sheer uh, selfish genes that are trying to protect themselves from other pirates. I mean, you can have a lot of thought <coughs> experiments, but um, I wouldn't go far as far to say that X wasn't possible or Y wasn't possible. There's RNA molecules on contact with oxygen will oxidize. <laughs> so there would have to be no oxygen in the RNA world. Okay. Right. Um, that, that is, it's, it's not fun as much as it is fun because it's a puzzle. It's a catch-22. Without oxygen, there's no ozone layer uh, to protect the RNA molecules from the uh, full force field of the rays of the sun and other radiations. And with oxygen, uh, you oxidize. Everybody knows we're supposed to eat our antioxidants because oxygen and other free radicals, other oxidizing agents, will, will uh, destroy uh, biological molecules in contact. The oxygen you breathe in is carefully channeled and shunted uh, around your body and, and kept away from uh, these tissues. If, if you get free radicals loose, uh, they can uh, cause mutations, uh, mutagenic, uh, carcinogenic uh, uh, tissue damage, and that has to be repaired. So these things, like the gasoline in your car, controls carefully this explosive gasoline, like the uh, uh, channels in your body control this, this volatile uh, oxygen. Uh, but naked molecules of RNA just floating in the water would be disassembled. Uh, the water itself uh, would tend uh, to, to uh, do a dissolution reaction on, uh, on proteins and nucleotides, uh, uh, nucleic acids. So there's, there has to be something hypothesized, which can be fun to do. And, and again, it could actually be true, but it's only an idea, and right now, there is a total catch point too. No life with oxygen, no life without oxygen in the RNA world hypothesis. And that's a problem, it's a question. Maybe they'll find the answer, but right now, you can believe in evolution if you want, but not because of the RNA world hypothesis. That not, isn't, isn't worth trusting yet. It hasn't borne the, uh, the data side of things yet. It's not data driven. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with not being data driven. It is wrong saying this is the way it was when it's on hypothesis. Um, but I would say we do store, um, when I make DNA in the lab or RNA, we store it in a water solution. Um, so, I mean, it, sure. I would say people far more clever than here I have uh, thought of fun ideas. So, seriously, go to Google and see what, see what other people have thought of. It's fun. I have a bunch of questions. If you don't mind. Question number one. They're all yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> if cancer is uh, a combination of between the 8.5 retroviruses we have in our body, or 8.5%, uh, 8 
then is it more likely that if I may so? 10,000 years ago, cancer was not as prevalent? Um, I think what we're finding now, uh, I wouldn't say that all